Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bierko of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's the former Wall Street bond trader. He has over a decade of experience trading bonds on Wall Street. And, uh, you know, he knows the the secret deals and the, where the where the plumbing is and how the sausage is made back there. Uh, he's a gold fund manager now, and he's the co-host of the Shadow of Truth podcast with Rory Hall. I really encourage our listeners to subscribe to that podcast and listen to it. I think there's a lot of interesting things on there. He also has the web website investment research dynamics and a short sellers journal and a gold stock newsletter i think now dave kranzler thank you for joining me again thanks for having me jason i love being on your show yeah and i enjoy speaking to you a lot dave uh you have just so much experience you know a lot of the people in the alternative financial media they haven't worked as long on wall street as you have so there's uh just not as a lot of reformed people on wall street you know normally the people who are making tens of millions of dollars on wall street they don't get reformed uh that quick they normally like to stay there and stick in the status quo and make a lot of money i kind of wish i stayed there too <laughs> well i give you a lot of props for having the courage to get out of there and you you know you have morals now and you have integrity uh unlike a lot of the people that are on bloomberg and cnbc you know that made a lot of money off of gold uh over the years and then uh go on tv now and bash it all the time i'm sure they're buying gold now too they just don't want to admit it publicly no question about that well, Dave, I, I want to ask you about your newest video that you and Rory just put out for Shadow of Truth. Uh, tie that in with with uh, your opinion of Hillary Clinton. Uh, we just had, for our listeners out there, we just had a really awe-inspiring video. Uh, Hillary Clinton did a speech recently in Omaha in front of Warren Buffett. She was talking about how the middle class uh, needs to have much higher taxes on them. Uh, some of the numbers for the taxes that are going to come out are going to be insanely high on the middle class. And yet the audience in Omaha, they were clapping. So I don't know. I can't tell if the audience that was cheering on these higher tax increases and Warren Buffett was clapping. I can't tell if they were brainwashed or I can't tell if they were, you know, $50 a day paid actors in there to stand and clap like seals uh, just for the money to clap at anything Hillary says. You know, to, to me, Hillary Clinton is is probably the, the the biggest horror show in the political history of the United States, and there's just no telling what's real with her and what's not. And I had I had seen mention of of that speech earlier in the day, and I, I it's gotten to the point where I can't even stand the sight of her. I can't listen to her voice. So it, it's whenever I, I see a headline like that, I, I just, you know, I just kind of shrug it off because, I, I, first of all, I think she's probably the most, most ruthless politician in the history of this country. I think she would do anything and say anything to get a vote. And it's, it, just, it, it just confounds me the way that her supporters turned a blind eye to the, all the truths about her. Like I was telling a, a friend of mine a couple days ago, I seriously think she could give a speech in front of an audience and she, and, and she could start stamping on a, on a bag full of puppies and kittens and people would cheer for her. I, I just, I don't get it. I mean, it's, to me, she's, she's emblematic of, of just how far into the Orwellian vision that was laid out in 1984, just how far into that this country's gotten. And um, I, I mean, to me, it's, it's if, she, if, she, if she seriously takes a seat in the Oval Office as the president, I mean, it just means that our entire system is, is just been sold out so far down the road. It's, it's like, you know, why, why even bother thinking about it or paying attention to it, you know, just go on about your business and do what you can to, to try and make your life enjoyable, you know, one day at a time. And that's, and that's the way I look at it. And ultimately I think she's, she's a pawn as, as Rory and I were talking about, she's, she's a, a pawn for a much higher elitist cult of power that's out there that you don't really see him and you don't really hear him. But, you know, those of us in the alternative media who look for the truth, I mean, we know we know some of the names of who they are. Some of them you don't know who they are. But it's certainly, you know, Rory's been writing a lot about the this, this, G, this group of 30. 
and, and giving that some exposure. And that, that's not something that's really been covered in the alternative media w widely either. So, um, and I think if you look at those people, those are the, the that's sort of the group of people who, who essentially hand down orders to people like Hillary Clinton. Yeah, Dave, I think there's an argument to me to be made that Crooked Hillary is arguably the most corrupt politician in the history of the United States. You know, going back and looking through some of the politicians that have gone to prison for long terms uh, or been impeached uh, or ones even with biographies coming out that were uh, involved in just so much criminal activity like Linda B. Johnson or Huey Long of Louisiana. I think, you know, Hillary's been doing it on a much larger scale than even uh, these guys for the most part. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I, in fact, I've, I've said that, and I, I've written it on my blog, that I, I think she's the most corrupt politician in the history of the country. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. And there's a documentary out there for our listeners who haven't seen it. Uh, show it to the women in your life that are brainwashed still, that uh, love Hillary Clinton, Clinton Cash. Make them watch five minutes of it. Make them watch five or ten minutes of it. You know, uh, Just sit them down and make them watch five or ten minutes of it and see some of the bad things that she has done. And the, obviously that documentary is not going to cover all the bad things that she has done, but it's going to summarize a few of the really bad stuff and just show how much of a hypocrite she's willing to do uh, uh, with her behavior. So she'll she'll say one thing and do the exact opposite, you know, a minute or two later. It's just laughable, though, now, Dave, to try to win, you know, Bernie Sanders supporters that she's going around saying she's going to police Wall Street. And here she is with the amount of donations from Wall Street investment banks and Wall Street hedge funds that her and Bill have been getting for speeches and for the Clinton Foundation, stuff like that. So I really don't think there's any chance whatsoever she's going to do anything to uh, even slap Wall Street on the wrist. No, of course she isn't. I mean, she's she's been bought and sold a hundred times over by Wall Street. I mean, Goldman Sachs gave her six hundred grand to do a speech not too long ago. If you look at her her donation her donation list, her top donor is a pro-choice organization, which you know I'm fine with that. That's great. You know, but pretty much any politician now, for the most part, is going to be pro-choice, even if they give you know even if some of the Republicans give the the pro-life contingency lip service uh, you know it's pro-choice is here to stay so that's her top donation and then after that every one of her top five or six donors are either big wall street firms or the or the law firms that keep the big wall street firms out of jail so i it just it's just stunning how you know the the difference between what really goes on behind the scenes with her and what she portrays to the public and the fact that the public is willing to buy into it. I did. And not that Trump's really a, a viable alternative. And for me, it kind of gets back to part of the reason why your vote doesn't matter. Because neither of these candidates are, alter are, are viable alternatives. And, it, it, you know, it doesn't really matter which one is sitting in the Oval Office because that's not where the, where the decisions are made. It's not made in the Oval Office. It's handed down to the people in the Oval Office. Exactly. The the people at the Federal Reserve and the other groups and the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy are the ones who are implementing uh, running the government day to day. So there are so many bureaucrats. I use the analogy about Reagan, uh, how he tried to defund so many government agencies and they just waited him out for eight years and they were right back to business as normal, even though he tried to shut down so many different government agencies. But I am terrified at the thought, though, of both Hillary Clinton and Trump having control of nuclear weapons. So uh, neither. <laughs> I agree. Ne yeah, neither, neither of them uh, having access to that, uh, that doesn't make me sleep that well at night. Uh, although, you know, I am sleeping much better at night, but if once once uh, either of them are present and I don't think I'm going to be sleeping too well. I want to talk now about the global economy. Uh, you know, we have these the stuff coming out from central banks now, Dave. Uh, we have the story that just came out yesterday or today about the Bank of England. They did an enormous rate cut, their first one since 2009, a large asset purchase program of 100 billion British pounds immediately into the banking system for emergency liquidity, and an announcement of a larger asset purchase program of 70 billion pounds per month. Uh, and this is in addition to that emergency 250 billion liquidity injection they did right after the Brexit vote. Uh, why do you think that these banks are uh, that these central banks are so desperate to do these things now? Are we really like on the brink that much? I think the financial system is, yeah, because I think there's just so much exposure to assets that are collapsing. And we're seeing it with the Deutsche Banks and the credit squeezes of the world. 
And we would be seeing it in this country, except the Fed handed the banks two and a half trillion dollars and pays them interest on it. So if, if you look at what if you look at what um, the Bank of England is doing, they're not doing anything that's going to stimulate the you know real economic activity. All they're doing is bailing out the credit system and bailing out the banking system because that money when they when they go buy bonds, they're buying it off of bank balance sheets. So it, how does that help the economy? It doesn't help the economy. I mean, it's insane. It's insane that the public swallows the idea that quantitative easing helps the economy because it doesn't. And it hasn't helped the economy here. I mean, we had a in the United States we had a we had a small bounce in housing, and we had a you know a fairly big bounce in auto sales. But they stimulated the crap out of auto sales with that cash to the, the cash for clunkers program. And then essentially making available eight-year subprime loans for anyone who wanted to buy a, a fairly used car or, you know, a, a not too old used car or a new car, you know, and 0% interest rates to buy a car. You could, basically, you could basically buy a brand new car for a couple hundred bucks a month payment. But, I mean, and all that did is it, is it artificially stimulated those two sectors, but it really didn't create any meaningful economic growth. And so what I would suggest is, is going on in England is I think the, the big banks, the big British banks are probably in a lot of financial trouble right now. Um, and, and so that's, that's why they're rolling out this program. Because again, if you look at how the flow of capital works when, when the central banks buy these assets, they buy these assets from the banks and then the banks hold on to that cash. It stay the bank the cash stays within the banking system. It doesn't get into the real economy. Now, it might stimulate a little bit more aggressive lending, but again, all that does is it's it creates a massive misappropriation of capital, you know, and that's that's what we're seeing in this country. I'm now getting reports from all over the country about a huge glut in commercial real estate that's formed. Um you know, and that includes multifamily apartment buildings. And I'm seeing it here in Denver. I mean, there's whole buildings that are empty with brand new buildings going up right next to them. And the reason for that is the banks don't have anywhere else to lend their money. So they're lending it out to to real estate. Yeah, Dave, to add to your point, there, you should come to the Washington, D.C. metro area sometime, drive around. We have three of the five richest uh, counties in the United States for average median family income. There's construction cranes everywhere, whether it's downtown D.C. or uh, Arlington County in the Clarendon neighborhood, which is, you know, where a lot of the uh, it has the highest amount of young professionals, I think, in the entire country living there. A lot of them move here from a lot of Democratic uh, Democrat states to come work for the government, hoping to get a government job or consulting job that's related to the government or government contractor job. But literally, there's, uh, you know, one story buildings all over the place in Maryland, Northern Virginia, and D.C. being torn down in favor of uh, remodeled, uh, you know, 10-story buildings with either condos or mixed use and things like that. So there's nonstop construction cranes here uh, with this bubble. You know, I, I always laugh when I, when I hear that three of the five richest counties, I guess, is that by county or by zip code? Probably by county. When I hear that the three of the five richest counties are in and around the D.C. area, because what does that tell you, man? <laughs> Parasites. <laughs> I mean, it just, it's like, it's, it's, it's government largesse is what it is. It's, it's the government taking your, you know, our tax money and, and spreading it to essentially what are leeches. Yeah, well, unfortunately, I think, you know, if Hillary Clinton, even Trump, uh, depending upon which government agencies, I think, you know, their solution is going to be infrastructure spending. Larry Summers is talking about a two trillion plus uh, inflationary infrastructure spending program for jobs. Uh, I don't know how many uh, full time jobs and how long and high paying those jobs will be. But, uh, you know, the, the gov those contracts are going to end up with unbidded government contractors around here, just like how things always work. So it's not really going to create any long-term sustainable recovery. Uh, it's not going to create any value added. It's going to just pad the pockets of more of the construction companies around here that have been getting a lot of the unbidded contracts to begin with. God, it's just incredible. Well, well welcome to Dystopia, buddy. Uh, 
look at the other central banks. You know, we were discussing this before we started recording. The Swiss Central Bank, uh, my friend Lewis sent me uh, on, on uh, the NASDAQ holdings. The Swiss Central Bank is making public their stock investments. They own, you know, millions of shares in uh, Apple Computer, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, they've been starting to buy Facebook <laughs> so shares. So, I mean, this, this is just unbelievable. Over $60 billion equity holding for the Swiss Central Bank. The Bank of Japan owns lots of shares. Um, you know, this this is getting to really the total perversions of Keynesian economics, that Ben Bernanke helicopter speech. What do you think will stop all of this, Dave? Do you, do you think there's an end to this? Is there anything you see that will uh, stop the central banks from being able to create as much liquidity as they want and buy up as much assets as they want? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting that you asked that question because I got a call from Dr. Paul Craig Roberts earlier today and we were talking about the hit that was put on gold after that bogus employment report and about all the money that's being printed by the central banks and and his his comment was you know what's what's going to stop them from to, from you know from printing why don't they just print forever you know what's going to stop that and I said well I mean at some point the currency is going to collapse and he said in his he was thinking well they, they kind of have control over that and I, I just he goes and collapse relative to what because every country's doing it and and I, ba I said you know that that's true but at some point if you look at if you look at China and you look at Russia and some of those um, some of those um, I, I don't want to say the BRIC countries because Brazil is falling apart obviously and the US is in trying to take control of South Africa but um, a, a lot of those countries that are allied with Russia and China are, are they're accumulating massive amounts of gold and yeah they may be printing money although I'm not aware that Russia necessarily is per se I think China might be printing money to keep their their banks from collapsing but at the same time they're also accumulating a lot of gold and you have to ask yourself what are they going to do with that gold and I think at some point they're going to um, roll out an alternative currency that's going to be gold backed and and that in and of itself is is an event that would I think collapse the Western fiat currencies but then there's another problem because at some point and and I guess Japan hinted at it although apparently they're not really when it was first announced that they're going to do helicopter money the program that was rolled out isn't isn't really an aggressive helicopter money program but at some point I, you know in order to keep these economic systems from completely collapsing, I think the central banks are going to have to start dropping helicopter money. And that's where you just start to get, that's where you're going to start to get hyperinflation. I mean, we've seen a, a fairly, if you, you know, the government doesn't measure inflation. It, it measures a basket of goods that it puts together to minimize price increases. But if you look at pretty much just about everything that you have to use every day, it's gone up in price by a huge amount. So, so there, there is, there is inflation out there, but we haven't seen hyperinflation yet. And what will happen is if they really start having to go into the helicopter money mode, you're going to have such a, a, a rapid increase in the amount of money that's out chasing a limited amount of goods and services. And that's what's going to create hyperinflation. And that's where the currencies will collapse. So, you know, at some point, they're going to hit a wall on this money printing and it's, it's going to get really ugly. Do you think the U.S. losing a uh, full world reserve currency, the sole world reserve currency, the petrodollar ending, do you think these things will be the only thing that will stop uh, central banks in your Euro Western Europe, the England, the United States, and Japan from just flooding the uh, asset prices higher with more and more liquidity that they create? Well, here's my here's my thing with the U.S. losing the reserve status of the dollar because that that's what that's what causes the U.S. to lose its 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 grip on global geopolitics and it's already starting to happen and it's hard for me to play the tape forward because in my mind I think the US would rather start World War III than to give up the power that it's enjoyed for the last I don't know really since since Bretton Woods as having the the reserve currency of the world so um, I, I don't know what that's gonna look like again I, I think 
I think China is, if I'm, you know, I, my guess is, and who knows, this is just sheer speculation. I think what they're trying to do is just try and create a real slow transition into a, a world with, with a new currency and a world that, that's had its currency reset. And I think, I think the U.S. is resisting that and fighting it, and I think that's why you're seeing the U.S. military belligerence ramping up in the South China Sea and ramping up around Russia's borders over in, in uh, Eastern Europe. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I, I think if we, we are due sometime in the near future, I don't know if it's two years or five years or 10 years, but there is going to be some type of global economic reset uh, but the thing is, I think that reset will be even more inflationary. They will, you know, layer inflation on top of inflation on top of inflation. Uh, because, uh, and the reason for this is, you know, I go back and look through history and I see what they did during Bretton Woods and I see what the gold exchange standard was, you know, after World War One, And all of those systems, when they tried to do a global economic reset, were all highly inflationary as well. So uh, I think, you know, it's just historical precedent that uh, when in the modern global financial system, these central bankers, when they don't know what else to do, they just figure to do a reset and, and, you know, add on more inflation. And these central, a lot of these central banks, Dave, are now talking about implementing fully digital currencies on digital blockchains, uh, you know, probably where they'll have, you know, a hidden back door in there for the government to add uh, unlimited currency units and you know, that allows them to do cashless societies and other things a lot easier as well. Yeah, you're right. And actually, now that you bring that up, you know, that was we were hearing a lot in the in the press and the alternative media about um, the digital currency conversion. It's kind of it's kind of gone quiet, which uh, it's, it, it could either be really spooky <laughs> or maybe it's a good thing. I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I, I still have to. I, I for me, where I've placed my hope is on the fact that you know, a lot of countries around the world are accumulating a lot of gold, and and hopefully, hopefully that'll um, that'll undermine this idea of a digital currency. Yeah, I, I agree about that. I don't I don't know if every single country wants to go full cashless society, but you know, obviously the U.S. and a lot of countries are discussing it behind the scenes. In terms of uh, you know, the discussion of countries using uh, digital currencies. Uh, I actually live right outside of Washington, D.C., and there's a, a, a blockchain a trade association right here, and I'm friends with the founder of it, and she presented to the Federal Reserve and I think 90 other central banks. They uh, flew in here and had representatives here for a day or two, and they had you know presentations from Bitcoin and blockchain-leaning experts. They obviously don't want to use Bitcoin, but they want to hijack the technology behind Bitcoin, the blockchain technology, and governments want to hijack that and use that for their own uh, government-issued currencies. And also there was a Bloomberg story, I think in May, about a secret Wall Street meeting. It was so secret, in fact, that no journalists were, uh, no fi mainstream financial media journalists were actually allowed to go to the meeting. They were only told about it by bank CEOs a few days afterwards and given, you know, whatever details about it. But uh, there was uh, all, all the large bank CEOs there, so the five or six main ones, you know, like the heads of the mafias, <laughs> they were, you know, uh, there on a weekend without media present, uh, testing private bank issued blockchain technology coins. Uh, they're seeing how things would work and how quickly they can implement those as well. Maybe, you know, in case there is a bank collapse uh, that starts in Europe and spreads to the United States and they could roll those out, you know, uh, in preparation. That's true. And, you know, I've always the way I've looked at this idea of a digital banking system and digital currency is that it's just another step towards complete totalitarian control over the population. Because once once that happens, once they eliminate cash and, and outlaw cash, that gives the government just that much more control over your financial affairs, right? Yeah, I completely agree. And then they can just layer on, you know, as many new taxes as they want, and there's nothing you can do about it then. I mean, you, 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 like right now we have a very large underground economy. I think in Europe the estimates are that the European Union, over 40% of, of all their uh, economic activity in there is underground, and people intentionally don't put cash in banks, and they have to be paid cash off the books so they don't have to pay the value-added tax and all the other extra taxes layered on. Uh, I've talked about this in other interviews. You know, Dave, I think... I think the people in power, the economic and political elites, you know, Federal Reserve politicians, I think their goal is to just layer on as much taxes in so many different ways that they can and then just create so much inflation and then use uh, Soviet 
union type of economic propaganda with their you know jobs numbers gdp cpi things like that and uh most people are either brainwashed or don't care that they or they're you know, self-medicated, they're playing Pokemon Go all day, or they're they're playing Pokemon Go all day, or you know, in Colorado, maybe they're uh, they're hitting the bong for uh, for me t- too many hours. <laughs> no doubt about that. Yeah, so you know, the, if people are self-medicating like that, they're not going to be in touch with reality with nearly as much as what's going on, or they're not going to care as long as you know they have enough money to uh, meet their fix and have like a halfway decent basic life. And I think. Uh, you know, that's the way a lot of uh, Europe has been set up right now. The standard of living in Europe and a lot of countries is way lower than the United States. But uh, Americans, it looks like, are being set up to be screwed over like uh, a lot of Europeans were when the European Union was created. Wow. You know, um, real quickly here, just to circle back to our, our discussion about um, misappropriation of capital in the banking system um, and, and the fact that these banks are lending a, a lot of money to real estate because they have nowhere else to go with the money. I had gotten a, an email from a subscriber a couple days ago and, and he's a business owner and he said he had just met with his banker for his yearly credit line review and they got into a discussion of the state of the economy and he said that real estate loans, that this is the banker, said that real estate loans dominate his and most loans, most bank loans to small businesses at this time. And my subscriber asked him if real estate was was more than one third of the of the loans on their books, and and the banker said yes. And he said management of his bank would rather have more regular business rather than real estate loans, but the but the the demand for non real estate loans just aren't there. And um, you know this is this is really an indication of the true health of the economy because if you got grassroots businesses that aren't borrowing money. It means that they're not selling their products, and it means that businesses aren't forming. And and to me, that really was sort of emblematic of of the state of affairs in our financial system. Exactly, David. And to add to your points there, it also means that they're not hiring full-time employees. So they're not investing in property, plan, and equipment or capital goods and are not expanding their businesses rapidly. Uh, the small business people that I talk to that email me on my, uh, from my podcast, they tell me, you know, with the Obamacare tax and all these other taxes – they're just scared to hire a lot of additional full-time employees because if they have to fire them for whatever reason, you know, the business slows down and then they could get sued and, you know, all these other uh, additional problems that can happen. Yeah, no doubt about it. Okay, Dave. Well, I, I want to ask you now about shorting the stock market. With this much liquidity, uh, do you think it's going to be especially more challenging than in the past to actually get uh, make money shorting sto- uh, certain types of stocks or industries? Well, that's an interesting question, and I, I have that conversation with people every day. And you know, part of the reason is because I put out a weekly short sellers journal, and I, I have you know at least one idea for shorting the market every week. And what's good about it is, um, you know, I get I have to look at a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of stock sectors. I have to compare the performances of a lot of different stocks and sectors versus the S and P. And what's interesting is that, you know, although the S&P keeps drifting higher, you know, it just floats higher on, on, a, on a, it's almost like a helium cloud of Federal, Federal Reserve intervention and, and hedge fund algos. But if you look at, there's a lot of subsectors that are significantly underperforming the S&P 500. Some subsectors are actually declining. And individual stocks within those sectors, some of them are just getting obliterated. So, um, for instance, if you look at the housing market, um, overall, the, the, I, you look at the Dow Jones Home Construction Index, and I don't remember the exact time frame, frame, but let's just say probably the last six months, the Dow Jones Home Construction Index has underperformed the S&P by quite a bit. And some of the stocks are actually in downtrends, some of the home builder stocks. And, and some of the home construction supply stocks. So that, that's just one example. Another example is, you know, Weight Watchers. I mean, when I first had started up my short sellers journal, so this, I, I put Weight Watchers out as a short at $21 a share in at the end of December. And here we are a little more than seven months later 
and Weight Watchers has been cut in half. I mean, it, it was it was at ten dollars this morning, and it was down pretty hev- pretty hard today. So there there are opportunities to make money shorting the market. And again, it's it's to me it's mostly the you know the headline indices, the marquee indices, the Dow, the Weight Watchers was down five percent today, uh, and that's why the S and P's hitting a new all time high. Um, but the Dow, the S and P, the Nasdaq. I mean, that's the only thing that the mainstream population pays attention to, or or they probably don't even pay attention to it. They might have, they might have their um, local newscast on at night tonight because they want to hear the weather report or they want to hear sports scores, and they happen to hear, oh, the S and P 500 set a new all time high today, you know, and they'll think, oh, great, you know, and so that's that's what. The, the propaganda masters want people to think that stocks are really going higher. But the truth is, there's a lot of stocks, and, and, and also it makes people think that the economy is doing better. And even if they don't have a good job and they got fired from a full-time job and they got to work two part-time jobs, they'll be like, oh, there's hope for me because someone's doing well because stocks are hitting an all-time high. And that's kind of the psychology they're exploiting. But the truth is, Price to revenues. Revenues are decline have been declining for the S and P 500 now for four or five quarters in a row. Same thing with net income. Same cash flows drying up. That's part of the reason a lot of these companies are issuing a lot of debt. That and also to buy back their stocks. So you know you might just and what's really driving the S and P 500 is a handful of tech stocks. Zero Hedge wrote about it. I think it was yesterday. You know, it's Apple, Amazon. The fangs, yeah, right? Google, and not even Apple. Forget Apple. It's Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, Netflix, and Facebook, and those are the stocks. And if if you strip those stocks out, the S and P is is flat to down. So um, again, I think that kind of speaks volumes about what's really going on beneath the marquee lipstick that they're putting on the pig and I, I think if you're careful on how you select your stocks I think there's a lot of money to be made shorting stocks yeah I agree with you but uh, you know a lot of retail people shouldn't be shorting stocks because uh, they don't they don't understand how much more difficult it is uh, in order to uh, make a profit shorting stocks. Uh, I was actually talking with Kevin Duffy. I did a couple interviews with him, hedge fund manager, bearing asset management. Uh, I've interviewed him twice in the last couple months, and he's been shorting stocks successfully for 20 years. I think what's happening, Dave, uh, and to outline your points there, I, I think you know the general stock market indices like the Dow and the S&P, uh, you know, the, the XLF, the banking stock, uh, financial services ETF, I think they're trying to either – prop these things up or manipulate them higher or slow down how quickly they collapse. So with certain bank stocks, you know, like Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank should have already crashed even further than already has. We can just see plain evidence on the charts with, you know, weird V-shaped recoveries in a day or two where the stock, you know, a miraculous not-for-profit buyer just comes in when there's a clear downtrend, it's a falling knife. You're, you've been trading stocks and, and bonds for a long time, Dave. Uh, how many professional traders would go in there with either their own money or the firm's money and go in there and buy a falling knife? Uh, buy, buy a falling knife like Deutsche Bank was a couple weeks ago. And yet, you know, miraculously it does. It has an enormous comeback in the stock. Yeah, though, there's no question that central banks are propping up Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse. And, you know, for that matter, all of the U.S. banks. I mean, let's not leave the U.S. banks out of it. I mean, not only in and of themselves are the, do the U.S. banks have, essentially they're all technically insolvent. But, you know, without, if you, if you had to pull away that, that, that money that the Fed gave them that they called QE, it's, it's about $2.4 trillion sitting on, on their balance sheets in the form of excess reserves. If you pulled that away from them, all these banks would collapse. So... Um, and that's, again, to get back to our, our discussion on the BOE announcement about their QE today or their, their money printing program, which is what I prefer to call it, because that's really what it is, it's money printing. Um, the only reason the central banks are printing money like this is to keep their, their, their member banks or the banks that actually own the central banks themselves, uh, they're doing it to keep those banks from collapsing. Yeah, and those emergency liquidity injections, uh, 
it were collectively for global central banks over $180 billion per month now in collective quantitative easing. That's only on balance sheet. That's only what we've seen in the press releases from statements and on the websites of these central banks. That's not off balance sheets counting currency swaps or anything else. So there's just no transparency in any of this. Uh, to talk further about shorts, though, Dave, you know, I think the restaurant industry, we've seen data come out about this on Zero Hedge and elsewhere. It's a 5% drop in Americans going out to eat just in the last three years. I mean, that's tens of billions of dollars in sales that are just have just vanished in the last three years. Uh, I told you I live right outside of D.C. in very affluent counties, and even a lot of restaurants that I drive by here, the parking lots are empty Monday through Thursday. People just don't eat lunch and dinner out anymore, a lot of these restaurants. So, Dave, I think a lot of these restaurant stocks, the casual dining ones, the sit-down ones, the, the more middle-class restaurants, I've heard even the high-end steakhouses, especially the ones that like have exposure to Texas area because of the oil bus, you know, they're going to see a 20 or 30 percent drop in the next couple of years, probably in their shares pretty easily just because, you know, their check size is down. They're not getting customers. Uh, they're holding a lot of inventory from their food that's going to go bad and things like that. I, I agree with you. I think the restaurant sector is, is, the, is another sector that that is on the cusp of, of um, just getting completely hammered. And I was trying to look for it because I actually wrote about that in one of my recent short seller journals. I, I one of the one of the feature sort of macro sectors was the um, the, the restaurant industry and and the fact that uh, the growth the growth in revenues in the last couple quarters has really started to go south, which is a, a really negative. Um, indicator in terms of the whole economy so um, and that's so that's one of the sectors that I'm also going to be kind of focusing on going forward is is the restaurant sector because I, I again I do you know as, as you well know I mean restaurant spending is highly dependent on on disposable income right yep and so if you don't if you don't have the you know a lot of disposable income, you're not going to be going out to eat at a restaurant. And it's expensive now to take a family of four out to the restaurant. I have friends with with kids and they just that they complain about that all the time. Yep. And I think that's why so many restaurants are empty at least Monday through Thursday now. Although, you know, now what I've seen is commercials where these guys are willing to take you know, obviously the industry, the margins in the restaurant industry are small to begin with for the most part, but they're willing to take totally razor thin margins now offering these package deals now for people just to get them put bodies in the seats to come out and eat. That's right. Um, I just, I actually just found that, that data and it's um, in, in uh, Q from, for, from the first quarter to the second quarter of this year, the, the rate of growth in revenues in the restaurant industry was close to zero. And that contrasts with the same period a year ago where the rate of growth was about three and a half percent. And so it just tells you that, you know, people are starting to slow down their restaurant spending. And at some point, especially wait till, wait till the higher Obamacare insurance premiums really start kicking in. If you recall, though, that Obamacare payment system it was designed to really start to ramp up after this election because they didn't want they didn't want people to get squeezed on their income ahead of you know the possibility that the next president might you know they didn't want to take away the possibility of the next president being a democrat because the economy was just visibly in a tailspin so um you're going to start you know you'll start seeing much higher obamacare premiums for the average middle class household and that's that's just going to destroy restaurant, you know, uh, the restaurant industry. Did you see the Lawrence Kotlikoff article that came out last week or the week before? He was saying how Social Security ran a six trillion dollar deficit in the last 12 months, you know, using gap accounting, accrual based accounting, which the government doesn't use. And he said basically that uh, they're going to put in a 32 percent increase in the Social Security uh, t payroll tax. So people's take home pay if their employees is going to drop even more, you know, in the next uh, year or two very, very quickly. Is that right? Did he indicate when that's going to go through? Uh, well, he was talking with government economists. He said they're going to have to do that 30. He estimates a 32 percent increase in the Social Security payroll tax in the very near future. 
uh, but the government doesn't want to talk about it. But he said that, like, off the record, his buddies uh, working in the government, because he's friends with the uh, Office of Management and Budget and the other government economists there, that they said basically they admitted they're going to have to do it. It seems like it. I mean, if you look at uh, there was an article that was out just a couple days ago that talked about how um, essentially the Social Security fund is is pretty much out of money at this point. And and it, it, it actually started the amount of money going into it versus the amount of money being paid out started to decline in 2010. So, I mean, you either have to cut benefits or you have to raise the amount of money. You have to increase the amount of money that goes into the fund, right? Yep. Well, my generation, Generation Xers and Millennials are totally screwed. So we're going to have more and more money taken from our paycheck, and we're probably not going to see, you know, even a dime of that when we're older and potentially ready to retire. Hey, I'm I'm 50. I'll be 54 next month, which means I'd be eligible for Social Security. What in in uh, five and a half years? I think I'm screwed. I don't think I'll see it. Yeah, that's true. Good point. And you've been paying, yeah, and you've been paying into the system for a lot longer than I have. Well, Dave, I want to ask you now about gold and silver for the rest of the interview and gold stocks. Real quickly, you know, we've it... had a, a little bit of a correction for gold and silver. I think the obviously it's manipulation. At least some of it is. Uh, but do, why do you think gold and silver have had such a strong rally then since November and December? Hang on one second. I might have gotten that wrong. I think fifty nine and a half is when you're eligible to start tapping into your IRA. I think, is it 62 when you're eligible for Social Security? I yeah. think it's 62. Or maybe yeah, they increased that's... it to 65. Either way, I'm never going to see it. So, Well, yeah, and they're going to do means testing. I mean, that's coming as well. So they're going to, people have been paying into the system for decades. They're going to do means testing and take the benefits away. Um, for, for the younger generation, though, I mean, it's a Ponzi scheme like Obamacare is, where, uh, you know, you have to pay in more and more taxes and you're not going to be able to collect any of the benefits when they're older. Uh, Obamacare, like uh, it's younger, healthier people paying in lots of higher premiums. So the sicker people who can't pay for their health insurance will get covered. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, welcome to Dystopia, Dave. I mean, this just goes into that argument that I've been that I've been saying earlier that basically they're just coming up with new ways to layer in inflation and taxes on people. That's right. Anyway, let's get back to the mining stocks because that's that's the fun part to talk about. Yes, it is. Finally, after uh, you know the five five year uh, paper bear market, yes. Absolutely. So, um, in terms of, I think you I think you had asked me a question. I forgot what it is. Why do you think that uh, gold and silver and mining stocks have rallied so strongly since November and December? Uh, boy, that's a good question. I, you know, I mean, the, the simple answer was because they were just done going down, you know, and that's that's not really a smart ass answer because that's kind of a that's kind of a stock answer. You know, why why is the stock going higher? Because it, it was sold out and it was done going down. I think that I think beneath the surface. And again, this is all stuff that's hard to prove, but but, you, you know, you can connect dotted lines and and the. You know, I, I try to look for as many dotted line indications as I can. For instance, one one dotted line indication that gets completely dismissed or ignored by most, I think most of even the alternative media bloggers is what's going on in India. And yes, India is basically hasn't been importing gold since early March because of the the, the, the jewelers strike over there over the over the excise tax on on jewelry that was put into place. And, and so um, they basically have been, have been boycotting the whole industry. But, you know, they still have to make a living. And what's going on over there, and I get a lot of this information from John Brimlow's Gold Jottings Report, which is a three times daily report on the gold market, that it, he aggregates a lot of information on the gold market into one place. I mean, a lot of it you could replicate on your own, but it would take a lot of time. And who has the time to do that? So he does it, and it's it's not a cheap subscription. But um, there's there's a lot of smuggling going into India right now, and it's it's hard to quantify it. And so if it can't be quantified, then a lot of people say, oh well, I'll just toss that out. It can't be very meaningful. And it actually, as it turns out, because he'll post articles, links to articles from act from Indian newspapers and journals. And there will be guys in there who, who talk about how it, it's, the smuggling is very significant right now. In fact, there was one guy over there who was, I think he's a former 
government official or something. I think he was a former treasury official, you know, finance ministry official. And he said that um, the, the part of the reason that they're not lowering that the 10 percent tax, you know, the, the import duty tax on gold, it's, it, it's at 10 percent. It's been at 10 percent since, I think, 2014. The reason why they're not lowering that is because smugglers are paying off government officials because smuggling is so lucrative right now. So even though the, 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 the price of gold that the buyer ends up paying in India is $100 above the world gold price of gold, they're still paying it, which means they're not paying enough to cover also the, ex, the, the excise tax, or the, the not the excise tax, the import duty, but they're paying enough to make it well worthwhile for smugglers to smuggle gold in. And, and the government officials are looking the other way because they're receiving these payoffs. And again, that's impossible to prove, but it's, it's something that makes sense to me. Um, you know, a lot of, there's been reports that, that imports into China have been down a lot. And that's, sure, the imports through Hong Kong are down, but that's because there's a lot more gold going into China through Beijing and Shanghai. So well, the, what, I think is, Shang what I think has happened is that you've had these enormous paper shorts, these paper claims that have been sold on physical gold. And I think they've reached the end of their rope on that. And I think they're, I think the guys that are short claims, paper claims into buyers, I think buyers are, are asking for delivery. And I think you're basically, you're at sort of a, a just in time inventory management situation with the supply of physical gold versus the amount of physical gold that is being demanded for delivery. And most of the de demanded for delivery gold is in the Eastern Hemisphere, but it, I think it's also starting to pick up in the Western Hemisphere. And I think that's, I think that's why, if you go back to mid-December, that's when this uptrend in the price of gold and silver started. And I think that's probably when it, it really started becoming a problem for any entity that's short paper gold. Um, I think it was started becoming problematic for them to get their hands on gold and silver to deliver. And I think I, that's what's I, at the end of the day. I think that's what's driving the gold market right now. I, I also think negative interest rates are driving the gold market too. And Absolutely. also, Absolutely. yeah, I think yeah, as a bond trader, you could probably uh, you could probably say a lot better comments about that than me because uh, I, I don't know. Did they even have any such thing as negative interest rates when you were trading bonds on Wall Street? Oh God, no! I mean, the 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 long bond was yielding nine percent or close to ten percent when I started on Wall Street back in ninety. Well, I actually started on Wall Street in eighty five, but when I started as a bond trader in ninety one, the, the long bond was yielding close to ten percent. So, um, no, not even close to negative interest rates. I don't think anywhere in the world. But um, there's actually been some uh, several studies over the years that show that there's a very high correlation between negative interest rates and the price of gold and the and, and the price of gold going higher. And so as long as as long and this is real negative rates. So as long as real negative rates stay negative, you know, as opposed to the nominal negative rates that we're seeing in some of these European countries, um, as long as real negative real rates in this country are highly negative, right? You take a real rate of inflation, you subtract it from the short term, the federal funds rate, and you've got a negative real rate. So um, as long as, as real rates stay negative, you know, there's going to be upward pressure on the price of gold. I don't care how much paper they want to throw at it. And what's interesting about that is there's this fallacy that when central banks start hiking interest rates, that, that it's bad for the price of gold. And that's actually not true because, um, I forget who it was. Um, Gibson's paradox, Larry Summers wrote the paper, right? Well, well, that was one of the papers. Yeah. Um, that, and I think the original work was in the late 1920s when that, when it correlated negative real rates with, with the price of gold. But, um, there's a, there's a, um, I can't think of his name. He, he puts out a pretty good, um, newsletter, Adam something. And he did a study where he showed that, um, over the majority of the last interest rate hike cycles in this country. And I think he looked at 11 of them. More than 50% of the time, the price of gold rose, and it rose by a lot. And that's because by the time they start raising rates, real negative rates are, are 
are negative, and it takes a long time and a lot of rate hikes for them to get real rates back above zero. And so that's, that's why the price of gold has tended to rally over interest rate hike cycles rather than get, than get smacked. It's just it's another you know, propaganda myth that higher interest rates or raising interest rates is bad for gold. It's actually just the opposite. Yeah, normally when they raise high interest, uh, when they raise the interest rates higher, it normally means the inflationary expectations are picking up. They're trying to calm down inflation in the system. That's right. Uh, assume, assuming it's not a free market, obviously, if if uh, that's what central banks raising interest rates, like what Paul Volcker did, and him admitting that the inflation was a lot and trying to raise the interest rates above the inflation rate. Uh, the gold and silver price still rose. He had to obviously raise interest rates a lot, and then he admitted in his memoirs he should have manipulated the gold and silver price and not allowed it to rise. That's right. Well, Dave, uh, also, you know, I think there is with the Shanghai Gold Exchange, there is a bit of a drop for the amount of withdrawals for physical gold. But I think uh, what has happened, though, is that the uh, Western world has been getting a lot more physical gold and silver to offset the drops on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Uh, I, I think, you know, uh, the last during the paper bear market from 2011 to you know, late 2015, I think a lot of money managers, managers on Wall Street wouldn't want to be caught dead saying they owned any physical gold. Uh, but, you know, now things have changed just in the last eight months or so. And, you know, now that gold has had and gold stocks have had such a big rise, these guys are going to be scrambling just to say they own, you know, any gold. Uh, if they're a, a regular money manager, they can't obviously own any physical gold. So they're going to have at least some gold stocks as exposure. Then they want to at least show at the uh, end of the year that they at least have some gold exposure because of how well it's done already. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, how well do you think gold stocks are going to do in the future? Because uh, what worries me about the gold industry, and we saw this uh, prior to the bear market starting, was there was a lot of really bad juniors out there. And, you know, they pay a lot of money for advertising. Maybe they run a drill program once in a while. And the management teams, uh, whenever money is raised, the management team is putting 70, 80% of the money into their pockets directly for salaries. Um, I don't know how true that is. I, I think if, if you look at a long-term graph, I, I think I just did that. I did that uh, exercise yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, because I, I stuck the graph in my mining stock journal that went out last night. And I took it back to um, September of 08 because it was in late October, early November in 08 after they had taken the Huey down from about 500 to 150 and then had the financial collapse and that's when gold and silver and then a couple weeks later the mining stocks started to take off and the mining stocks ran from 150 to a little over 600 is where they topped out um, I'm talking about the Huey index I mean a lot of juniors did way better than that um, I seriously think that you know, I think the the sector has run a lot in the in the first seven months of the year. I think we've had a big move in it, and it, I think that you know, if we move sideways or consolidate here, it's going to be healthy. That doesn't mean that we will. I, you know, I mean, the the sector's been manipulated lower and held lower for so long. It's going to have sort of that effect of holding a beach ball underwater, right? And every every month that they, over the last five years, that they were holding that beach ball underwater, there was more air being pumped into that beach ball. So the snapback effect is, is you know, is going to presumably be equally as violent. I think we've seen a pretty violent snapback effect so far. I mean, some of these juniors have run from a nickel up to 50, 60 cents or even more. But if you look at where even, even companies that have run from, from five cents to 50 cents, if you go and you look at a historical chart of where they were eight, nine years ago, some of these stocks were two, three, four dollar stocks. And then, um, then, you know, so that's that's what I think we're looking at in this cycle, at least. And a lot of these companies have really gotten lean and mean. They've cut, you know, the ones that are producing have, have cut their uh, their cost of production down significantly. They've, they've just made their entire cost infrastructure a lot leaner. And a lot of these juniors, a lot of them are sitting on cash that they've just been sitting on waiting for the market to come back. So they've got cash on their balance sheet and investors are financing these things again. 
So this could this could start off another long term cycle, and and you know I think we've maybe seen at most ten percent of the move that we have the potential of seeing, you know. And so if you've got if you've got say your stereotypical, let's just call it a, a small cap producer, it's got two or three million ounce gold reserve that it's and it's going to produce it's projected to produce two hundred to three hundred ounces a year of gold over the next ten years. Well, the market's valuing that company between 200 million and 300 million, and that's with the price of gold at 1300. Now, what's the market going to value that company when the price of gold is at 2,000? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, you, you could have your your two dollar stock all of a sudden run to 10 because of the 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 um, the upside operating leverage that's involved with gold mining. I mean, once these companies are making a profit. On the gold that they're producing at thirteen hundred dollar gold, every every dollar that gold goes higher drops straight to the bottom line for these companies. Yeah, and the high the high frequency trading trend trader algos, you know, if that stock does go from two dollars to ten, they could hop on and push it even no, far, then farther go, up. Then they'll go Amazon.com on us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's what I think. When I first got into this sector back in '01, James Dines had been writing about the gold stocks for, I don't know, probably 18 months to two years, maybe. Maybe he just started in 2000, I forget. But he made a statement that caught my eye. He said, at some point, you know, who knows when, but we're going to have a move in the mining stocks that are gonna, that's going to dwarf. We're going to have a bubble in the mining stocks that will dwarf the Internet stock and tech bubble that we had that culminated in, in early 2000. And we haven't seen that yet. And I, I, I mean, I wholeheartedly believe that at some point that's on the, that's going to happen. We'll get into a situation where it won't be a real small part of the investing market that gets into these stocks like we saw from 2008 to 2011. But it's going to be everyone. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the your hairdresser, your barber, your taxi cab driver will be giving you stock tips then on gold stocks, just like what happened during the technology bubble. How they were giving stock tips then on internet stocks. Wouldn't that be funny? Guys like you and I will be taking Uber rides to get stock tips from the Uber drivers. See what these guys are buying. <laughs> yeah, that'll be time to. That'll definitely be a a, a contrarian indicator to start unloading positions then, or at least taking some money off that's, the table. That's probably but, good due but, diligence to do at some point. You know, when you feel like these stocks have really started to outrun their 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 value. And they've started to get frothy. Maybe, maybe we start taking Uber rides to see see what stock you know to see if the Uber drivers are pushing these stocks. <laughs> but, but I think you know, with the restart of this bull market, now that the cyclical bear market is over, the paper bear market, because there was strong physical demand during the paper bear market. Uh, you know, now that we're back in a bull market, you know, there it, it's almost impossible to know when the bull market is going to end because it's impossible to know when the central bankers are going to stop flooding uh, with the liquidity injections. We have over from, according to Jim Rickards, you know, who eat, who has dinner with central bankers all over the world. He says that over $30 trillion has been put into the system since 2008, uh, just to keep it up. We have over 180 billion per month now in collective QE, like I said earlier, to put that in perspective, that's over $2 trillion in liquidity that's going to be added just in the next 12 months. And that's only what we know about from the PR statements. That's not counting, you know, any additional uh, currency swap programs that are going into the derivatives markets or to save the banks that they're not telling us about or, or any of these other things that are not on balance sheet. Here's what I would so, say, Jason, and I think you kind of answered your own question here. You know, how long can this go on? I mean, the fact that you're asking that question, how much longer can this go on? Or the fact that I get emails from, from my mining stock journal subscribers almost on a daily basis, did I miss the move? You know, the fact that people are still questioning this rally tells you that it has a long way to go. Well, that's how bull markets work, Dave. What's the Sir John Templeton quote? Bull markets are built on skepticism, uh, built on pessimism, rise on skepticism. Uh, and then it's optimism and euphoria, and then that's when you should sell is during the euphoria stage. That's right. When uh, everyone is just happy and buying like crazy. That's right. And so, so, we, so still I mean, have, this... we got plenty of skepticism and pessimism out there yep. right now. Yep. So that's the fuel that is necessary 
to create that nice stair step movement in the bull markets. There's potential people there that can switch their psychology from being uh, bearish to bullish that will eventually, you know, just give up. And that's how, uh, you know, uh, bear markets switch to bull markets. That's right. Okay, well, uh, Dave, I want to thank you again for your time today. I enjoyed this discussion like always. Uh, please tell our listeners about your Shadow of Truth podcast, uh, your gold fund for people who are interested in investing, and uh, the other stuff, the other uh, paid newsletters you have on your website. Sure. Um, so uh, Rory Hall, who, who puts out the Daily Coin blog and is doing some really – interesting work um, and interesting studies on this group of 30 that I had no idea even existed until we started talking about it in our last podcast. And then I started looking into it and I'm like, oh crap, this is not good. But um, uh, so anyway, we do a bi-weekly, not bi-weekly, a twice a week podcast, Mondays and Thursdays. Um, and we just, we talk, basically we try to talk about whatever is, is a, you know, the most current events going on that are related to markets and politics. Um, and then I have my blog, is, which is Investment Research Dynamics. And in early December, I rolled out the Short Sellers Journal, which is a, that's a weekly newsletter. And I, I give what I think is sort of my own unique take on what's going on in the markets. And I, and I review some, some short sell ideas and I, I try to throw in some ideas on using options to short stocks, even though I think you got to really just short the stocks themselves and hold on to those shorts. And then I also have a mining stock journal. Now that one is biweekly, so it's twice a month. And I review the gold market and come up with a junior mining stock idea. And I try to find stocks that are not really well known or covered out in the general blogosphere or, or you know in the internet. Um, so um, you know that's that's my business right there. I do manage a small precious metals and mining stock fund, um, and it's it's kind it's kind of an accredited investor. It's a private fund. Yeah, because some of my listeners, uh, you know, they're successful business people and small businessmen. They own their own business. They are looking to uh, give someone money to manage for gold and gold stocks. Uh, but I, I think there's a certain requirement, like you said, so not everyone can meet the requirement. Sure. And we I am in discussions with both my partners and then an, another colleague of mine. We're, we're looking into rolling out a junior mining stock only hedge fund. And that will also be, you know minimum net worth and income requirements. So you have probably, you're going to have to be an accredited investor, but um, we're, we're in this stage now where we're starting to talk to potential investors. Excellent. Well, I think, I think your timing couldn't be better. So I, I think, you know, it looks to me like the dip is being bought by, you know, not just gold bugs and silver bugs like you and me, the dip is being bought by regular Wall Street money manager types who are managing billions of dollars who normally wouldn't like gold or silver, but because it's in an uptrend, because, you know, they see negative interest rates and these other things, they're kind of, they feel like they're kind of forced to at least have some exposure to gold and silver. I completely agree with that. And I've been pounding the table on every time they slam the market like they did today, gold and silver, buy it. I mean, I moved, again, I don't, I don't have enough cash sitting around to buy an ounce of gold every day when they smash gold. But, um, you know, I'm, I moved, I did one of my biggest moves into my bit gold account, which is buying gold essentially, but it's in smaller seg, uh, it's in smaller increments than having to buy a whole ounce. And I moved quite a bit into that, into that today. I did it twice. Once when gold was down 18 and right after the market closed when gold was down 23. Since I still have you on here, Dave, we get a lot of listener questions about Bickold and gold money. I think actually now they fully changed their name from Bickold to gold money since the company's merged uh, because Bickold was confusing for some people. Uh, you like the company, uh, their services there. You've had uh, success and uh, use uh, using their platform and taking delivery of gold. It's really easy to move the money in and out for you? Very easy to move the money in and out. Um, I actually have not taken delivery of the gold yet I've thought about it but um, at this point I'm just kind of using it as a as a surrogate checking account that pays me interest I mean I you know just since the beginning of June gold is up well before today gold was up 12 percent so and I you know most of my money had already been in the account by the beginning of June 
So, uh, you know, the 12% of the appreciation in the value of the account was what I would call interest because of the, the appreciation of gold. So as long as the price of gold keeps moving higher, you can look at that as a, as a lot of interest you're earning on a checking account. And you can use it almost like a checking account. They don't give you checks that you can write, but it, that you, you get you can get a um, MasterCard debit card and whenever you want you you move money from your your bit gold gold backed account and you load up the MasterCard with with that money and you can use it just like a debit card and I use it all the time it's great very cool and the the it's not also like a regular bank where the bank teller is going to look at you funny for making a large withdrawal of your own money and threaten to you know inform the IRS or or your potential T word or uh, they're talking about a bail in if you're uh, one of our European listeners and they're talking about bail ins of European banks. That's right. Um, Bit gold or gold money, whatever you however you want to refer to it, it operates completely out of outside of the banking and central bank system, and that's what I really like about it. Me too. I, I think it's a good business idea. I actually really like their stock. I think you know it's one of those stocks that could potentially uh, grow, keep growing revenues uh, a lot. Although you know it's not a high margin business necessarily to begin with, but they can grow revenue a lot. It's got a good technology component. They've got a good network effect. So you know it could trade like a technology stock at some point in the future, which means potential you know decade, 15, 20 years from now, you could be looking at tenfold returns if uh, the gold bull market goes the way we think uh, it does, and a lot of people all over the world uh, accumulate physical gold and silver. Yes, I agree with that. And and there's a reason why the Soros family owns 10% of the stock because they they know it's a good idea too. <laughs> well, Eric Sprott also owns a, a big chunk of the, he was an early investor in the company yes. and Nolan Watson of Sandstorm Gold was one of the early seed investors. So it's not it's not 100% Soros owned. So I don't want no, to, no, <laughs> any of our listeners. Never, no, they only own yeah. 10% of it. Yeah, so I don't want our listeners to go out there and say, "Oh, it's it's wholly owned by Soros," and you know he's gonna it's it's all a front, and you know the the, the you know what they say about Soros. Yeah, so. no, so. it's not George Soros himself. It's it's his. I think it's actually his kids who made the investment. That's what I was. That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah, and I think they can tell, you know, that this company, they have a, a lot of potential for revenue growth and uh, bull market was starting. They got in basically right on a, at the at the bottom of the gold bear market. So, Dave, I just want to thank you again for your time and I enjoyed the discussion. And uh, let's keep this going in a month or two from now. Likewise, Jason. Thanks for having me.